Did you know that you could study the Bible in 5D? Stay tuned to find out about a unique system that you can implement that will help you see the Bible like never before. My name is Jason Bradley, and you're watching Urban Report. Welcome to Urban Report. My guest today is Pastor Ivor Myers, speaker and director of Power of the Lamb Ministries, and he is also the co-host of Dare to Dream Network's Salvation in Symbols and Signs. Welcome to Urban Report, Pastor Myers. Thank you, uh, Jason. Thank you for having me. Uh, I'm looking forward to this program today. Um, I think we had a, a good uh, uh, um, study in our last session, and I know we're continuing on, so I'm looking forward to uh, just uh, getting deeper. Absolutely, work. absolutely. And, you know, you, you've taken it five dimensions deep. I mean, you, with this photo theology thing, we're going five dimensions deep. So, mm -hmm. you know, for our viewers that haven't seen yeah. part one, why don't you uh, give us a little recap of what photo theology is and then also touch on the five dimensions? Okay, so uh, basically, phototheology is a um, term that I've coined, and that term is the phrase that I use to describe my method of Bible mm -hmm. study. Uh, phototheology is the art of studying the Bible through the use of images. Uh, we've all heard the saying, a picture is worth a thousand mm -hmm. words. Um, so I, I take that philosophy and apply it to the scriptures. Um, so I'm basically teaching uh, my students how to see the Bible in pictures and then how to take these pictures and learn to create storylines with the different pictures, do different things with the different mm. images. And um, I found is that it's it just uh, 10 X's your ability to understand scripture uh, kids are using it, people who have been studying for years, uh, you know, from whether they're young or old, using this system, they're beginning to, to see and get so much more out of their Bible study. Uh, and so that's what we're going to be talking about yes. today. That is a bird eye view, or I should say a nutshell description of what photography gotcha. is. So now when you say you, you teach your students to draw other like pictures from the stories, how do you do you mean like you you help them to see parallels? So like uh, give us give us an example of some parallels that you can see. So um, the the idea and we talked a little bit about this in the last program. Um, before I do that, let me let me let me give a little okay. bit more foundation. So we were talking about the Fort of the mm -hmm. Palace. And you remember that we discussed this, you know, this imaginary palace uh, that has 24 yes. different rooms, right? Six floors, 24 rooms. Each room is a different principle in phototheology. So one of the rooms that we discussed uh, last, uh, uh, on our last program was the, the concentration room, which is one of the one of the foundational rooms or principles when it comes to phototheology. Uh, it is the art of taking images or pictures and looking for a match, mm. looking for the comparison uh, um, with Christ in particular. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if I shared this or not in the last program, we talked about Waldo, um, or I, I'll often share the analogy of those, those little books, Waldo, uh -huh, Finding Waldo. Uh -huh. uh, you know, you know in those books, the object is to find Waldo on every yes. page of the book, right? No matter how, how much detail is on the page, you know Waldo is somewhere on the page. And so phototheology approaches the Bible um, with that idea mm. in mind, that Christ is on every page mm -hmm. of the scriptures. Um, so when you begin to look at stories with that idea of where is uh -huh. Christ, right? 
with that concept of where is Christ in the story? Where is he in the text? Where is he in the parable? That's when things begin to jump uh, off okay. the page. So one example that I would give is um, the story of Elijah and Elisha. Okay. Uh, now, I don't know if I shared this on the last program or not, but um, Elijah uh, came before Elisha. Mm -hmm. Elijah, there is a transition of power from Elijah to Elisha at okay. the Jordan. Elijah is then taken off the scene, and the disciples of Elijah go on to follow Elisha. Elisha has a double portion of the power that Elijah had. I think I see where you're going with this. Uh -huh. okay. And, his, and Elijah, Eli, Elisha's first miracle after crossing the Jordan was he provided, water, he provided drink for the thirsty. Mm -hmm. All right, so... You just said, I see, I, I think I see where you're going mm -hmm. with this, right? Um, for those that are listening, you may be in your minds right now like, wait, what? And that's probably because as I was giving you that picture, you started playing the concentration mm -hmm. game, mm -hmm. right? We described uh, uh, the last program, concentration game. You have all the cards facing down. Uh, it was a card game I played when I was little. Have all the cards put, uh, facing down. And the objective is to find matching mm -hmm. cards. You have to remember where you saw the matching card. And when you find it, you know, that's a point or that's a victory. Whatever it you, however you describe it, this is the same thing. When I describe this, m many of you perhaps began to think, wait a minute. That reminds me of Jesus and John mm -hmm. the Baptist. Why? Because there's a transition of power from John the Baptist to Jesus at mm -hmm. the Jordan. After that transition of power, John the Baptist is taken off the scene and Jesus continues on. Just as Elisha was more powerful than Elijah, so John the Baptist said, I must, de I must decrease and yes. he must increase. The disciples of John the Baptist go on to follow Jesus. And Jesus' first miracle after crossing the Jordan is he turns water mm, to wine. Yep. Mm -hmm. So basically, all we did just now was we just studied the Bible using images, using pictures and stories wow. that most everyone who's ever studied the Bible is already familiar with. We just played a matching game. And now we're like, wait a minute, what? Yes, yes. That excitement begins, the, the, the story jumps off the page because you're studying it, not just through words. I'm not saying that mm -hmm, we do away with mm -hmm. words, but what, what's happening is that you're bringing a visual element to the stories. And when you do that, things suddenly come mm -hmm. to life. Yeah, it just jumps off the page at you. So, so touch on the five dimensions, because I remember you telling us that, you know, we study in, in 2D as opposed to 5D. Right. So uh, to recap about this five dimension, five, by the way, the 5D room, short mm -hmm. for five dimensions, is one of the rooms in the photo theology mm -hmm. palace. And basically what that principle does is it allows us to see the scriptures in five dimensions. Those five dimensions are in order, the literal dimension, and then the Christ dimension, and then the me dimension, and then the church dimension, and then the heaven dimension. So the question you would ask in each dimension is, how does this relate? You know, what am I studying? What is the text saying mm -hmm. literally? That's a literal dimension. Then where is Jesus in the text mm -hmm. or story? That's the mm -hmm. second dimension. Then how does it relate to me? That's a third dimension. How does it relate to the church? The fourth dimension. How does it relate to heaven? Mm -hmm. Fifth dimension. So I think last week we talked about the sanctuary and how in each, you know, 
There's the literal sanctuary, then Christ himself is a temple, uh, is a sanctuary. Uh, destroy this temple, I will raise it mm-hmm. in three days. Then I am a temple. Then as a church, we are the temple or body of Christ. And then there's a heavenly sanctuary. We can do that for, for different things in the scriptures. We can do it for the priesthood. In the Old Testament, there was a literal priesthood, right? That's the mm-hmm. literal dimension. In the second dimension, Christ is our high priest. Uh-huh. In the third dimension, I am called to be a priest and maybe the priest of my own mm-hmm. household. In the fourth dimension, we are a royal priesthood. And the fifth dimension, we will be kings and priests with him for a thousand years in heaven. Right? So basically, you're... you're, you're Learning to see one text in five mm-hmm. different dimensions, one verse, one story, five different dimensions. This opens up, right, the way that you study the scriptures. Because, as I said, uh, most people study the Bible in mm-hmm. two dimensions that's the literal, and then how does mm-hmm. it relate to me? I know, Jason, we, we also talked about the question yep. room. We were talking about asking the text questions. I don't know if I mentioned this when we when we uh, talked last, but we talked about the challenge of you know opening or asking questions, mm-hmm. uh, as many questions as you can mm-hmm. of the text. Fifty questions, a hundred questions, and then I, again, I don't remember if we discussed this, but we did that first, and then what I'm what I what I want to demonstrate is that. When most people, when I lead my students to ask the text questions, this is before we do the dimensions one. So when they get like 50 or 100 questions uh-huh. from the text, and then I introduce them the dimensions room, and I'm like, now, you were only asking questions in one dimension. Wow. wow. That's when their minds go, wait, what, Yeah, what and that's 50 to 100 questions oh, in, in only one dimension. But yet there's dimension. five dimensions. And there's wow. five dimensions. So the reason that we ch- that we that I try to encourage my you know my students ask the text questions a- because what happens is when you ask the text questions you begin to think about things re- about that text that you maybe never ha- would never have thought mm-hmm, about before, mm-hmm. right? So our goal in the question room is to learn how to become good detectives, mm-hmm. asking questions that other people didn't even think yes. about. And when you ask those questions, they tend to lead you on, on thought patterns where you're like, wait a minute, wait a minute. I never thought about that before. Well, if this is if this happened because of this, then oh, <laughs> uh-huh, oh, uh-huh. oh. And that's when you get those aha uh-huh. uh-huh moments. Got you. So we actually have uh, several graphics that we didn't have a chance to get to last time. Why don't why don't you okay. kind of touch mm-hmm. on what the importance or significance of, is of these uh, graphics? Okay, so um, one of the rooms we talked about, and this room was on okay. the ground floor. Uh, we talked about uh, the twenty-four frames per second uh, room. We talked about the importance of memorizing the themes of each mm-hmm. chapter, because that's how you're going to. Uh, populate, if you will, or furnish your phototheology mm-hmm. palace. The more pictures you have in your phototheology palace, the more effective your Bible study yes. becomes. So we basically created this uh, this uh, method of of memorizing the different themes of the mm-hmm. chapters. Um, so the picture you were just sharing uh, is picture of planet Earth with a one mm-hmm. on top of it. And that picture, when you see that picture, the idea is to remember that that is what is found in Genesis chapter one, the creation okay. of the Earth. And so when you see that image of the creation of the Earth and we see uh, uh, the Earth with the big one on it, we're always going to remember Genesis chapter one, mm-hmm. creation. Mm-hmm. That's supposed to be locked into our yep. minds. All right? What is the next let's, one? Let's put the next one up. That's, that's the Genesis chapter one. Let's put the, uh, yep, there we go. 
So that looks to me, I'm, I'm picturing Adam and Eve. Okay. Mm -hmm. That image, and I can't, for some reason I can't see it on my screen, but I'll, there we go. So here you have uh, a picture of Adam and Eve. Now, I'm going to sh show you something that you did not notice in this picture. So look at Eve's hair. What do you see? Is that Eve's hair? Yes. It seems. What if it oh, table? Oh, number two. Very good. So I'm going to always remember that when I when I think about uh, the Eve's hair in the shape of a two, I'm always going to remember. Yep, yeah, that's Genesis chapter two. That's where we focus in on wow. Adam and Eve. Right. So you're you're using memory mm -hmm. devices, um, using images to help you remember the theme of yes. each chapter. Right, so the next one. All right, we'll put the next picture up here. Okay, so there you see the serpent. Uh, uh -huh. um, and you will notice that the serpent looks like he's in the shape of a, of a uh -huh. three. You'll also see that the tree looks like it's in the shape of a, of a three. Uh -huh. So I'm connecting the serpent and the tree with the number three to always remember when I get to Genesis 3, three that's the story of the tree. That's the story of the mm. serpent. When I do this, what begins to happen is I'm, I'm now depending on these images, mm -hmm. right, to, to uh, uh, wake yes. up my memory. So now I'm, I'm thinking uh, planet Earth. I'm thinking Eve's hair. I'm thinking the, th the a tree in the shape of a three. And I begin to be able to go move rapidly through these chapters going, yeah, Genesis 1, creation, Genesis 2, Adam and Eve, Genesis 3, that's the tree. Genesis 4, the picture that you see on your screen now, is the story of Cain killing his brother. I see blood on mm -hmm. the rock. The blood is in the shape of a four. I'm going to always remember when I, whenever I see that image in my mind, I'm going to remember that Genesis chapter 4 is the story of Cain killing wow. Abel. Wow. And we have, we have two more pictures. All right. So this is Genesis chapter what? That's six. Should be obvious right there. Mm -hmm. That's six. The six has been flipped on its side to, to, uh, to be in the shape of a boat. I'm always going to remember when I see that six mentally that that is a story of Noah building yes. the ark. Yes. And our, 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 our right. uh, sixth picture. Okay. Now, what, what is this? Now, this is, this, yeah, this is Genesis chapter okay. 17. And Genesis chapter 17, um, the 17 is in the shape of a scissor. Mm -hmm. This is a painful chapter. This is where mm -hmm. Abraham is circumcised. Oh, yeah, that is a painful chapter. That's right. You will never forget that Genesis 17 is a chapter that Abraham is circumcised because we see the one and the seven in the shape of a pair mm. of scissors. Mm -hmm. That's going to remind me, oh, yeah, that's a painful chapter. Like, think about it. Feel the pain, right? Like, everything that you can, when, when we're talking about these yes. chapters— you want to bring every sense you possibly can mm -hmm. into it, right? So when you're talking about uh, Cain uh, or, or the, the, the tree in Genesis 3, think of the taste of the fruit. Think of every, uh, employ every yeah. sense to make that image stick mm -hmm. in your mind. Mm -hmm. So the reason that we're doing this, Jason, is because, again, we're training our minds how to think in pictures. Gotcha. Got you. Photo theology. Now, uh, okay, I, I know some oh, people no, no. have seen you preach and all of that stuff, and, and they have to be wondering, how do you prepare your sermons? Yeah. So um, this is, to me, this is, a, this is a huge advantage to photo mm -hmm. theology. Um, let me address another issue here while, while we're at this. 
So one of the problems that I hear most often when people say, you know, hey, this is the this is my struggle mm-hmm. with Bible study is the issue of time. Okay. Mm-hmm. I don't have time to Bible study. Right? I don't know I've, if you run into that yeah. issue, Jason. Mm-hmm. Um, we're so busy. We don't have time to study. And that is, you know, a huge mm-hmm. complaint. Mm-hmm. So full theology totally destroys that I'm not going to say an excuse but it moves that out of the way it's it answers that problem let me say it that way because it's a genuine yes. problem mm-hmm. people are busy they got a lot of things going on kids, blah, blah, yeah. blah, right for theology answers the problem why because when I have Genesis 6 and Genesis 5 and Genesis 4 and Genesis 3 And Genesis 17, when I have those stories locked in Mm -hmm. my mind, Mm -hmm. I can now do Bible study in my mind while I'm driving, while I'm doing Mm -hmm. the dishes, while I'm out exercising. My Bible study is no longer limited to, okay, it is now time to sit down and open my Bible so that I can wow. Bible study. I got you catch you. what I'm saying? Wow. You have just 10 x once again, your, your Bible yes. study time. If I, if I have all the stories of Revelation in my mind, mm-hmm. like, I'll give you an example. Right now, if I want to do a study on the seven churches and the seven seals, I typically will not have to go to my Bible and open it up and say, okay, it is time for me to study the seven church. Because I yes. have it here, my Bible study is wow. here. Wow. See, that's that's huge. That so yeah. So when it comes time for me to put together my sermon, it's pretty much already happened mm-hmm. here. Mm-hmm. When I go to the Bible, all I'm doing now is I'm finding the verses that were already right here. Got you. I'm putting together the storyline that was already put together yes. right here. Yes. Uh-huh. Right? That's your... Because memorizing verses, a lot of people, oh, man, I got to memorize the whole Bible. Yeah, I, my memory is not... I, I can't. You know, that's never going to happen. All right? Let's translate those verses into images. Mm-hmm. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, I could do that. Let's put that in your photo theology palace. Wow. Uh-huh. Right? So in a sense, in a sense, I'm showing people you do have a photographic memory. Yeah, and see, that's, that's huge with that Bible study, like, in your mind, because you can be on the go. It doesn't matter where you are. You can be studying the Word in your mind. And when there comes a time where we don't have access to our Bibles, um, you know, Absolutely. that will come. It'll be that much more um, incredible during that time as well and needed as well. Absolutely. So, so that, that kind of brings up. No, what were you going to go say? Ahead. That kind of brings up what? I was going to say that that what I just talked about kind of brings us into another room, which I don't think we talked about uh, um, in our last program, which was the freestyle. Oh, biblical freestyling. Uh Uh-huh. Biblical freestyling. So there are two different freestyle rooms. There is the biblical freestyle, and there's the nature freestyle. So let me talk about the nature freestyle. That's the one I want to focus on, on, on today, and it's this. I believe Jesus was a master freestyler. Now, when I say the word freestyle or the term freestyle, in the hip hop industry, this is what we would do. We would often freestyle. Mm -hmm. And what that meant was you had to come up spontaneously with a Mm -hmm. rhyme. Okay. It was the art of spontaneous Mm -hmm. rhyming. So, in a biblical sense, the reason I'm using that, that term in a biblical sense is this. Jesus, I believe Jesus, he didn't pre-plan a lot of the things he was going to say. 
right? He wasn't taking notes like, oh, yeah, consider the lilies of the field. Uh -huh. I think he was in the field, right, talking to the people, and he'd look at the lilies and be like, consider the lilies uh -huh. of the field. Uh-huh, uh-huh. He's the sheep and the goats, right? He spontaneously would take object lessons from nature and make it applicable yeah. to the gospel. And he tailored it to the people he was speaking to. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So one of the things I encourage my students to do in the freestyle room is this. I want you, when you're driving to work, I need you to start thinking about object lessons regarding driving to work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right? When you're on the road driving, I want you to think about object lessons, okay? Huh, we are all on the road of life. Yes, that's right. You're on the road of life. And, you know, we need to be careful of what exit we get off because we, yes, yes. And you start making analogies, yeah. right, of the very thing you're doing in real mm -hmm. life right there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what this does is it enables you, if you're cleaning out your mm -hmm. garage, I want you to think of object lessons about garage, about cleaning out your garage. Wow, this, so there's a sermon if in you're everything. you're doing dishes, there's a sermon in yes. everything, uh -huh. right? We've got a and minute and a half left. I know you can't see the clock, but I want you to know we got no a minute problem. and a half, and I want people to know how to it access um, this, this course. So where can they go to get this course? It's powerofthelamb.com. Uh, that's my website. Uh, that's the easiest place to go, place to go. look up photo theology, uh, and you'll see how you can get access to the course. And I can't believe we just spent half an hour. No, I, I know. I know. It just it flies by. I mean, there's there's so much. What I love, too, is how you're able to juice, juice it down, see it in pictures, and study on the go. Yeah, that, yeah, that is right. incredible. What would you say to that individual that has never given Jesus a chance? We've got about maybe 30 seconds. I would say that for me personally, the best thing that I ever did was to give Jesus a chance. He changed my life. Uh, there is nothing that I regret about giving him that chance. And so I would encourage you to do the same thing. I think there is nothing to lose. You have nothing to lose. I think if you give Jesus a chance, allow him to come into your heart, you will see uh, what a blessing it is to live with a blessed hope uh, residing in your heart. Amen. Amen. Yeah, I, I've, I've seen a little bit of your testimony and how he's transformed your life, and that's truly a blessing. I want to thank you for joining us uh, here on Urban Report, and I want to thank you for tuning in. Well, we've reached the end of another program. Join us next time, and remember, it just wouldn't be the same without you.